Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, College of Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series on Race, Equity and Justice and welcome back to the spring semester. Uh, I'm Bonnie Thornton Dill. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities and professor in the newly renamed Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies. So this morning, of course, is the first of our series for the spring semester. And it, as some of you may recall, it's part of the college's broader initiative on race, equity, and social justice, developed around the goal of understanding and dismantling structural racism. Our strategies as part of this um, initiative is, include transforming curriculum and scholarship reducing discrimination in teaching, research, and service, and expanding the impact of this college's longstanding and continuing scholarship on racism, anti-racism, equity, and justice. Also consistent with President Pine's uh, focus on racial justice and identity, we introduce new members of our community, uh, as we introduce new members of our community, we're pleased to have students participating with us as part of Terrapin Strong onboarding program. In our HU, part of our approach is to offer opportunities for our students to be exposed to the many different ways faculty in the college study and teach about these issues. So as you know, in this series, I invite faculty experts from across the college to discuss their scholarship and creative projects related to anti-racism, uh, and social justice, um, uh, and particularly uh, African-American history. The format for each session includes a brief presentation followed by a conversation with me and then an opportunity for all of you uh, who are on this uh, Zoom call to ask questions. Uh, so we ask that during this time, you keep your microphones on mute. Um, during the last 15 minutes or so, 15 or 20 minutes, we'll ask you to submit questions through the chat, and that will be moderated by Associate Dean Linda Aldury, who will manage the question and answer. So, uh, and also please note, this event is being recorded for future viewing on the college's website. So today, today's session features Pro Professor Quincy Mills, who's an associate professor of history. Dr. Mills is the author of Cutting Across the Color Line, Black Barbers and Barbershops in America. He also edited William Still's 1872 text, The Underground Railroad Records, narrating the hardships, hairbreadth escapes, and death struggles of slaves in their efforts for freedom. And he did that as a companion to ta Coates' debut novel, The Water Dancer. He is currently working on his second book, tentatively titled The Wages of Resistance, Financing the Black Freedom Movement, which received support from the American Council of Learned Societies. Dr. Mills' talk today is titled Movement Money, Crises, Relief, and Democratic Practice, and will focus on economic autonomy in struggle. He brings together his previous scholarship on Black barbershops and his current research on grassroots funding for civil rights activism from the Scottsboro Boys to the Poor People's Campaign. So at this time, I am happy to turn the screen, microphone, stage, whatever it is, over to uh, Dr. Quincy Mills, Dr. Mills. Thank you so much, Dean, uh, for that lovely introduction and, and welcome. Um, so this is, for those who ha I, I have not met, which is probably most of you, uh, I've been at UMD for, I guess, a year and a half now. Um, and it feels like I barely know the place, <laughs> largely because of the pandemic and the closing, right? I was on campus for literally a semester and a quarter. Um, and so it's it's just good to sort of be here um, to to engage with you all. I should also say, while I do have a lot of books behind me, I'm I am not on campus in my office. 
Uh, I don't want anyone sending me an angry email saying that you are not cleared <laughs> to be on campus as I did when I went to campus for like five minutes to get a book on a Saturday. Uh, and of course the card swipe signaled to somebody that I was there and should not have been there. Uh, nonetheless, I'm at home uh, safe and healthy uh, with my family. Um, so I just wanna, uh, I'm gonna give some uh, some brief uh, remarks um, uh, uh, to to open up our conversation, um, and then I look forward to engaging with the dean and certainly everyone else uh, thereafter. Anti-racism as both policy and initiative, uh, while necessary and, and important, uh, I'd argue that it can obscure the needs and the well-being of the very people that they are looking to assist. Um, that's to say that in some ways I'd argue that anti-racism doesn't actually speak to black students, particularly in higher education, um, to think about, and certainly this series, right, is coming out of, the Dean series is coming out of, uh, uh, um, uh, the importance of talking about race justice and equity. To think about this, I like to sort of target the civil rights movement. Uh, many have suggested that the civil rights movement succeeded in gaining legislation, uh, but failed in addressing systemic inequality. Uh, integration as a goal only served to bring a bit more access, um, but not necessarily accessibility. Uh, I would like to suggest first that it's unproductive to measure social movements as a success or failure model. Uh, but second, I'd like to suggest that uh, critics talk of the failure of civil rights only because they fail to see the fictions of civil rights. Uh, sure, there's truth in every fiction and fiction in every truth, as my colleagues in literature uh, can speak to so profoundly. Uh, yet the economies of struggle and the possibilities of policy hang in the balance of the relationship between the two. So my brief remarks here, I, I, I wanna focus on two areas of civil rights that have been overshadowed. Uh, one, the significance of willing congregation over integration um, and that economic inequality was at the center stage of black social struggle for freedom, and not simply a late stage post 65 realization and goal. Uh, and certainly my first book on barbershops and my current project uh, uh, on civil rights fundraising helped to illustrate these points. Um, and so I'm just gonna talk briefly about um, uh, both projects and some of the larger themes that uh, come out of them um, uh, to sort of jumpstart our conversation on uh, crises, relief and, um, uh, and democratic practice. Uh, and so my book on barbershops aim to um, essentially trace the the, the growth and evolution of the barbering industry um, and African-Americans place within it, uh, how they shaped it, uh, but also how barbershops as spaces emerge uh, to be uh, critical spaces uh, within black organizing, uh, but also black communal formation. Um, one of the most surprising aspects of doing the research on, uh, on barbering uh, was that, and I didn't expect to find this, uh, in the 19th century, most of the barbers, most black barbers, particularly in the South, um, exclusively groomed white, uh, white men, uh, wealthy businessmen, politicians. Uh, and that's largely because, as you might imagine, uh, during slavery, um, it was not, um, uh, um, Black folks certainly did not want black folks organizing spaces of their own <laughs> or having spaces that uh, white folks could not um, oversee. Uh, and so the barbershops essentially um, were commercial spaces for um, wealthy white men and certainly white men did not wanna be shaved next to a black man being shaved that would have smacked too much of social, social equality. Um, they also didn't wanna be shaved with, with the same razor that would have touched the face of a black man. And so these spaces essentially confused me, um, not the space I had, uh, not the business or space I had, I had, I was looking for essentially, but it's the one that I found. Um, and essentially I had to make sense 
uh, of, of these barbers, these black barbers who were quite wealthy, uh, but also quite prominent within black political circles. Um, and reconciling that was a major challenge for me. Um, and I figured out the issue, <laughs> uh, but I didn't figure it out historically. I figured it out because I tried to interview barbers um, uh, uh, in 2003 for the book and for the, the project. And frankly, and particularly in the South, and I had long dreadlocks at the time that came to my, to my waist. Uh, and <laughs> I expected the jokes. I expected them wanting to cut my hair but I did not expect them to refuse an interview. Uh, and they refused the interviews because as uh, one barber said, uh, I'm in the grooming business and you don't look groomed. Uh, another barber said, what does it look like that you wanna to talk to me about barbering, but you haven't cut your hair and I don't know how long. Um, and I got, this is in Atlanta and Durham and you know, by like every barber, right? Gave me the same response. Um, uh, and one barber said, look, we don't, we don't like that kind of hair, <laughs> right? Um, and it really sort of clicked to me that, look, yeah, these barbershops are spaces for men can talk and engage and debate and argue, sure. But this is their livelihood. This, <laughs> for barbers, this is their business. It's their livelihood. Um, there's a way in which they um, also sort of take pride in uh, constructing black manhood in some ways, right? Um, and so uh, that helped me understand those barbers in the 19th century, right? This was a business for them in some way that, that they were sort of accumulating some, some resources. Now, what they did with those resources was what I do talk a bit about in the book. And indeed, some of, many of them actually use those resources to um, uh, 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 provide for black communities, whether it's thinking about um, Alonzo Herndon in Atlanta, who went on to found, who was a barber, in, a pr prominent barber in Atlanta, um, was um, one of the founders of the Niagara movement with W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, he established um, an insurance company for um, black consumers. John American Durham, another prominent barber, uh, did the same thing, right? He established an insurance company, North Carolina Mutual, um, one of the founders of um, uh, uh, a black bank there in Durham. Uh, and so these folks were sort of using their resources in a certain kind of way. Um, and so resources became really critical for me and certainly autonomy, right? And so moving to the 20th century, looking at how these, these barbershops changed over time, and I won't, I won't get into too much detail, I can later, but over how that change took place. But in the 20th century, uh, major shifts um, such as a white barbers union, union was founded and uh, essentially pushed for licensing laws, right? The same licensing laws that states have today uh, that regulate the practice of barbering uh, that said, okay, now you have to go to a barber college to learn how to, how to be a barber. And you had to learn the anatomy of the body and you had to think about uh, public health, sanitation, um, all happening around between 1890 and um, 19 zeros. Um, and so uh, this, in, in addition to a new generation of African-American men coming into the barbering profession, wanting to essentially uh, target a black clientele, uh, also, as we know, the rise of Jim Crow, right? This is all happening at the same time at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and so barbershops emerge uh, uh, by the 19-teens, 1920s as critical spaces for uh, black men, particularly uh, and certainly beauty shops would come about the same time um, to, uh, 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 to gather themselves in a certain kind of way. Um, and and this, here's the important point here that I wanna sort of leave as I uh, move to uh, the current project is that uh, looking at the history of black barbers and barbershops, we get a, uh, an essential element of critical uh, and willing congregation. And I take willing congregation from historian um, Earl, Earl Lewis and his work on Virginia. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's, this is where I'm getting this from, frankly, and it helped me really shape the book and shape the project in, in, in some really important ways. Um, in addition to my colleague, um, um, uh, Elsa Barkley Brown's work, um, Eve Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's work on the church, 
uh, uh, folks who've looked at the black public sphere. And that's to say that um, uh, African-Americans have willingly gathered in certain spaces, uh, not because of Jim Crow, right? But because they wanted to think and develop uh, their political ideologies and worldviews in community with other black people. I think that's important to note because what we get from you know, popular history, right, is that the civil rights movement was about integration uh, and, 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 and the fight was for, was to sort of bring black and white people in the same room at the same time. And we certainly pull on King and his dream and it's supposed to be this utopia, King's beloved community where we're gonna all be together and yes, it's gonna be solved and the Brown decision helped that. And it was, it was, it wasn't to be. <laughs> Right, um, and so uh, where many folks talk about the decline of black of integration causing the decline of black businesses, in some ways, I see the argument. It's a very logical argument, um, uh, but it's an argument that only holds for uh, product-based businesses, right? Where where one is going to decide if they, you know, if you know. Uh, the toilet paper is cheaper at the black grocery store or the a and grocery store, right? Um, maybe not be the best example because the softness might also be an important factor in that case. Uh, nonetheless, uh, with, with sort of services, uh, that's different. And so the black church remained the black church after integration, right? Um, uh, black barbershops, black beauty shops remained predominantly black. Uh, and they did so because folks were there because they willingly congregated in those spaces. So that's to say, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'll, I can say more later. Willing congregation, one again, helps understand why barbershops are still important, beauty shops are still important, black churches are still important to black communities because we can certainly be together and apart at the same time, right? That sometimes you just need that space of refuge. Um, and barbershops help do that, beauty shops, black churches help in that capacity. Um, but it also helps us, and I, I'll say briefly, helps us redefine Brown, <laughs> right? Uh, because as scholars have, 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 have already argued, but it hasn't been take, taken off in any great way. What we miss from Brown is the importance of resources. Uh, the importance of resources, we miss that from the Brown decision. Um, the Brown v. Board of Ed decision. Um, and so it's these resources that, that, that I think are critical, but also how we think about what the crisis is, right? Was the crisis that black and white children were not in the same classroom or was the crisis that black folks weren't getting the same resources that white schools were getting? So what, how do we define the crisis? In the process of doing the research uh, on barbers, uh, I found so many oral interviews of barbers saying that they uh, felt free and open to support civil rights campaigns, right? Because they were independent, because their customers were black, because they were entrepreneurs. Uh, and that's a common theme across civil rights literature. That's not, you know, disputed in some way. Um, and that led me to say, huh, well, how was the civil rights movement funded? Uh, where did money come from? Where did all the resources come from? Was it just from the black business class and the, the black elites? Or was there more to the story? And that led to this next project uh, that I'm currently working on, uh, titled Wages, uh, The Wages of Resistance. Um, and scholars had, had, have written quite a bit actually about, um, about philanthropy. Uh, particularly the sort of major foundations that provided uh, funding to civil rights organizations. Uh, we see this most prominently in the voter education project where um, the Kennedy administration partnered with um, the Field Foundation, the Conic um, Foundation, um, the Fields Foundation um, to provide resources to uh, uh, a cadre of civil rights organizations like SNCC, uh, the N WCP and CORE to, to run voter registration uh, campaigns in the South, particularly education campaigns in the South. Uh, they didn't want them doing direct action. I think that was the point. The administration wanted to pull those folks from SNCC, those young students um, um, uh, uh, from doing direct action to uh, voter education projects. Um, and so 
uh, also been a lot written on, you know, uh, celebrities like Harry Belafonte, who gave tons of money to SNCC and others, but less so on the working class folk who only had like a dollar <laughs> to give. Um, and it's those folks that I'm mostly interested in, although I do talk a lot about um, uh, other sources of funding. Um, um, but in looking through SNCC records, for example, many sharecroppers, right, sent, sent in a dollar with a note saying, look, this is all I have. I hope it will help in our larger efforts for freedom. Um, and that those kinds of letters and those kinds of notes help me sort of uh, one, say that this one, this project is not about philanthropy. Um, although I think there's been some great work, uh, new work, um, such as Tyrone Freeman's uh, book on um, um, uh, Madam C.J. Walker uh, and, and Black women's philanthropy to say that, because this has been, I was vexed by this for, for about five years now and the book just came out. So I'm rethinking, <laughs> he is it's helping me rethink uh, my ideas on philanthropy. But my criticism of philanthropy was that it's about the elites. It's about those who have money decide where they give their largesse. Um, and in some cases it's self aggrandizement. It's, you know, uh, one way to sort of cement one's place in a capitalist world is to say, I've made a lot of money and I, I'm gonna give a lot of money, right? Um, but it's about this larger amorphous sort of public good um, and so in some ways I make a distinction between contributions and donation. Donations in some cases can be detached. I'll give some money and I'll go about my business. Contributions is about solidarity, right? There's a connection. So I'm gonna give my dollar because I know that what y'all are doing is gonna help me, right? I'm connected to this. Even if I'm in the North, I'm gonna send some money down South. Um, and so much of this project is, uh, frankly, just like it's it it is it is it is about that. So the wages of resistance sort of argues that fundraising for civil rights activism uh, fueled an activist economy, where an activist raised money in response to crises to provide relief from reprisals, um, uh, uh, which I'm calling sort of you know labor wages, right? So folks were fired from their jobs, you know by participating in civil rights activism. So they lost wages. Um, the expectations and accountability of activism and the ongoing concerns for meeting the financial needs uh, of social movement. And so organizations, I'd argue, had wages as well, right? So SNCC, um, um, they had to buy cars in order to, in order to transport people uh, to the courthouse to even attempt to register to vote. Um, they had to keep the lights on in the office, like they needed money to sort of keep things moving. Um, the funding, um, um, such as, you know, the product sales, many of them sold, they sold buttons or they sold records, um, the foundation grants and the individual contributions, but also the expenses, right? The administrative expenses, transportation, and certainly bail, because folks had to raise money for bail. These constituted the cash flow of resistance movements, right? So Black people's economic vulnerability and relative independence is the central threat, I argue, in the problems and the possibilities of civil rights activists. Yet activists, neighbors, and strangers banded together to provide relief in times of reprisal. Black activists transformed an informal activist economy from supporting the quote unquote deserving activists, which I'll explain in a second, as victims of reprisals or crises of social justice to supporting the fight against a larger crisis of capitalism as the target rather than a byproduct of civil rights activism. And so here I talk essentially about civil rights as a form of social welfare. Um, the manuscript here is organized around sort of major moments of social movements that I'm grouping as hell, hell, H-E-L-L, hell, jail, and bail to explore the politics and economy of relief within changing understandings of mass crises and protests between the 1930s and the 70s. Uh, each chapter essentially examines the hell of Jim Crow that African-Americans lived in and how they raised hell to disrupt the racist status quo. The political, violent, and economic reprisals that they faced as the state responded to black resistance 
and claims of citizenship. So that's the jail. Uh, and then third, the, re the, the, the resource mobilization to provide relief from those reprisals, that's the bail. And so in some ways I'm, I'm, I'm um, uh, uh, looking at hail, gel and bail and putting on top of that resistance reprisals and relief, right? To understand folks' everyday lives. Um, uh, at the end of the Montgomery Bus boy Boycott, Martin Luther King, uh, said that, quote, freedom has always been an expensive thing. History is a fit testimony to the fact that freedom is rarely gained without sacrifice and self-denial. So we must donate large sums of money to the cause of freedom, end quote. Uh, and King's, King's thoughts here, right, look at my time here, um, I'm getting excited, so excuse me, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up shortly. Um, uh, looking at, uh, at this moment, King was sort, of, was sort of thinking about the trajectory of the boycott, but I'd argue also thinking about uh, the reprisals that many African-Americans faced in Mississippi right after the Brown decision. So I'm gonna close here with two very quick stories here. One person you may not know about and one person you do, uh, Amzy Moore um, in Bolivar County, Mississippi. Uh, he helped to found the Regional Council of Negro Leadership in 1951, uh, became president of the local branch of the NAACP. Uh, in 1954, he opened a combination service station and cafe in Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, but when he, but in, in opening that um, service station, gas station and uh, cafe, there were both black and white customers who came into the space. Uh, and some local whites did not actually like that and wanted him to put a colored only sign in uh, the cafe and more refused to do that. Um, and so because of that refusal and because of his other work in, in encouraging folks to register to vote, um, he faced a number of economic reprisals, right? Um, and so he, um, uh, 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 the bank called his mortgage and to call a mortgage is to say that, that your mortgage is due, right? Forget about the 10 year period, nah, it's due right now. Um, he couldn't get credit. Um, and because of that, um, Megger Evers was uh, one of the field, was the field secretary in Mississippi, actually. Uh, he helped get aid for more, for Amzie Moore and other folks who faced similar reprisals. Um, and uh, what's interesting about Moore is that he was adamant that the NAACP should help him, should provide him with assistance. Uh, you know, then. WCP was not really keen on providing this kind of help, but they were forced to in some ways. Um, Rosa Parks, um, also a uh, freedom fighter for sure. Uh, and as we know, she was fired from her, from her job as a um, um, seamstress, Taylor, Taylor's assistant. Uh, and what's interesting is that considering all the money that the Montgomery bus boycott and the Montgomery improvements Association received both locally, regionally, and nationally, uh, those funds didn't go to parks. She faced a number of, I mean, she had economic hardships while she was active in the Montgomery bus boycott, um, but she didn't raise cane about it. She was not that kind of person. Um, uh, uh, for her, this was a kind of a sacrifice in some ways. Um, at the same time, I fought the leadership, frankly, uh, at not recognizing that she needed assistance. Uh, in fact, she had to move from Montgomery uh, in late 56 because uh, of her economic precarity, right? To make matters worse, uh, Parks was actually the head of the welfare committee for the Montgomery Improvement Association to provide assistance to local folks during the boycott who were either fired from the jobs or just needed some, some help, right? Um, and so you have these two folks, Amzie Moore and Rosa Parks, right? Both freedom fighters, right? Uh, but uh, sort of uh, essentially uh, um, thinking about their sacrifices much differently. It's not to criticize Moore, right? Because 
I, I would argue he should have had assistance. Uh, but I think that when we think about these kinds of reprisals and relief, then we could begin to think about the centrality of uh, economic inequality because these folks were in a place, a dependent place where they could be fired, right? Uh, uh, from their jobs because of their activism. And so I'll just sort of stop there, but part of what I wanna argue here is that if we look at the, at the local level, look at the ground level outside of the goals, right? The larger goals of democracy and justice, um, we can begin to see one, what gets classified as a crisis, right? Who gets classified as folks deserving of relief and support, um, but also what kind of democratic practices might be put in place uh, to provide that larger assistance. I would argue that nations should provide for their citizens, um, not just in times of natural disasters, um, uh, but in times of, 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 of folks' everyday survival. Thank you. Thank you, Quincy. Um, you said so much. <laughs> I, I hardly know where to begin. Um, this is really a fascinating conversation. I mean, it's fascinating to hear you talk about this because it is so layered and so nuanced. And at, at one point, I was um, thinking that I really wanted to ask you about kind of the significance of economic independence in um, the black community and clearly, I mean, you talk about that with the barbers and then you talk, but then of course that gets even more complicated. I mean, and you talk about that with barbering as a part of like a number of institutions that have had some level in the black community, some level of independence. You talk about the black church. We might even think about um, black colleges uh, with some level of economic independence. In any case, so there are, all, there are these institutional structures, big and small, that kind of create a space that can make resistance possible in some ways because they're independent. And then at the same time, you, you go on to kind of layer that in terms of the complexities of who gets supported and how and and and, and so, and, and then you were talking about philanthropy and I was gonna ask you some things about kind of rethinking what philanthropy is because th there's this whole sense that black people aren't philanthropic. I mean, people would say that and yet, you know, there are these institutions. So I'm really like, oh my God, where do I begin? <laughs> but I, I really am interested in your unpacking that a little bit more, talking more about kind of this tension between uh, uh, independence and kind of a commitment to independent economic independence of institutions and what it allows people to do and the same time kind of who gets supported within that uh, uh, framework and how those decisions get made because that seems to me to be a lot of what you're talking about when you say uh, civil rights is a form of social welfare. Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll answer that um, by going to a couple of source uh, a source here. So um, the NAACP took a very corporatist I'm going to argue a corporatist approach to relief. Essentially, um, they believe that so for example in Mississippi, uh, their response to economic reprisals in Mississippi was to um, uh, uh, encourage folks to don't to them not donate, but to deposit funds into a black bank, uh, Tri-State Bank of, of uh, Memphis. And this bank would then loan money to black farm holders and uh, landholders and homeowners um, who couldn't get credit, right? But the bank had to use its normal banking practices, <laughs> right? And so one had to be credit worthy in order to get this assistance from this bank. I would argue that was a corporate strategy. That was a sort of a trickle down, a trickle down model of relief. Now, on the other side, you take Ella Baker, um, who I argue by far one of the most visionary um, freedom fighters that there ever was, is, um, um, who uh, was one of the founders of an organization called In Friendship, um, which was uh, 
founded specifically to provide relief, economic relief for um, uh, black activists. And her approach in Mississippi and Montgomery and South Carolina was to give direct grants, right? So sure, it was still for folks who were active. So you couldn't just simply be someone who needed help. It was for activists. Yet there weren't, there weren't a whole lot of other strings attached, uh, largely because Baker knew that you had to support the people who were on the ground doing the actual work of organizing, right? Um, and certainly Moore, Amzie Moore was one of the folk who was actually organizing and is credited with bringing SNCC into Mississippi, uh, particularly uh, in uh, I'm welcoming uh, Robert Bob, Robert Bob Moses. Um, and so here's the deal though. So I think black folks generally for obvious reasons and many folks uh, are, skeptical, are skeptical of capitalism. Uh, and so what does it mean to accumulate money? <laughs> right? um, especially when black people were the products of that accumulation for a good part of the history of this country. Um, one, two, and then what do you do with that money if you have it? And so um, uh, 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 there's all have been all sorts of sort of uh, alternative economic models, right? Such as cooperatives, right? And so uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, for example, who faced it, who, you know, for registering, to, for trying to register to vote, she was kicked off of her land. Uh, and then after that, she worked with SNCC and was a fundraiser with SNCC. Um, and certainly towards the end of the 60s, she established uh, farming cooperatives because she knew, right, that black folks needed, they needed to be independent of the state and somehow, uh, and they couldn't be, uh, but particularly also the welfare state uh, uh, because that was also a carrot that the state used. And so uh, many Southern counties sort of took away welfare benefits from African-Americans because of their activism. Um, and so, Yes, it is, you know, the sort of trope of the deserving and the undeserving poor, who's deserving, who's not deserving. And it's all, as we know, it's all a huge freaking fiction. Um, uh, when so Social Security was established, uh, both social insurance and public assistance were one and the same. They were together under the Social Security Act. That got severed, <laughs> right? Uh, and so it got severed on the basis of work. And so... Mm -hmm. The deserving folks, the deserving subsidies was Social Security and those who were tied to work and the undeserving was not tied to work. And so I think it's, the, it's when some folks are getting power and they get to decide who gets it and who doesn't, that's where I think the democratic practice sort of falls um, by the wayside. And mm -hmm. so I think that, you know, there are all sorts of uh, ways in which you know, if we if we think about the people and think about the collective, and, and again, basic survival should not be a deserving or, or an undeserving. Everybody is deserving to to live. Everyone should have a living wage, period. Uh, and so, you know, uh, so sorry. I'll, I'll, I think that's 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 one approach to your to your question. Yeah, you know, I, I what I'm fascinated about here uh, in this particular story, and I do think it exemplifies. A larger story, and maybe that'll be your book after this book, um, is this uh, kind of constant tension and struggle in the African American community about ways to find and establish economic independence, and then the ways in which that either uh, gets taken away or gets lost in kind of bigger economic shifts that make those um, things that diminish those things in, in many ways. My parents were very active in the co-op movement. I mean, they really mm -hmm. believed in cooperatives and black cooperatives and they did all of these kinds of things. And, and, I, and I watched you know, what they were able to produce for that community, yeah. but then a whole bunch of other things <laughs> come along and make that, you know, it's a little, it's a drop in the bucket. It helped a yeah. few people, but it didn't transform as right. they had hoped, um, kind of the economic circumstances of, of the African-American community. And I think that's a long story, a, a, a history to be told. And I appreciate your um, kind of the insight that you're giving us on this um, 
through starting with barbers, but clearly through the civil rights movement and then the relationship of this to, to the overall struggle. So um, thank you, thank you for that. So, so let me shift um, uh, just a little bit. Um, well, let me just take that a little farther and ask you to project past the civil rights movement into the social movements of today and kind of what you see, we've got a very different mm -hmm. model in some ways in the movement for black lives. And mm -hmm. so, you know, how do you see this um, in this context? Uh, so I'll give two examples here. One is um, I've been encouraged by the, uh, the number of bail funds, uh, community bail funds that have been established mm -hmm. across the country. Um, um, as we know, certainly, you know, uh, many black, black, young black people are languishing in jail without having been convicted. <laughs> uh, they're waiting trial uh, only be and they're in there only because they can't afford bail. Uh, and so bail funds are, pro uh, community bail funds are providing that, um, that relief, um, for folks who can't afford it. Um, uh, and I see that, um, square and center. Um, I see Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement has been thinking intently about resources uh, and organizing. Certainly, a lot easier now, I think, to um, to crowdfund um, uh, and fundraise for resources. Um, uh, I want to note um, a uh, email that I received in, in anyone else who's attached to the Black Lives Matter um, listserv uh, titled. There's, there's no pension for living on freedom's front lines. Uh, and so they were, um, uh, and this was back in uh, December of 2020, uh, they were noting the passing of Janet Cyril, who was a, a member of the Black Panther Party, uh, uh, founder of the Free Breakfast uh, Program, and that uh, she had passed um, and they were, raising funds for the Janet Searle Fund. Uh, here, I'm gonna read this, which will quote, provide resources to our elders that sacrifice so much for our modern day fight for black liberation. The fund will ensure that our elder freedom fighters can age with dignity, but we need your help to help to support our leaders so we can reach their $60,000 goal before the Kwanzaa season is over in just two days. Um, so here they're thinking about, okay, so, you know, you know, and, and I've always, you know, sort of sit and made that statement that, you know, uh, activists don't have a pension. They don't have a retirement fund, right? Rosa Parks died fairly penniless. At the same time, Rosa Parks also said that freedom fighters never retire, <laughs> right? Um, so again, much to her character, right? Like, she's like, look, oh, look, the sacrifice, the sacrifice, this is all, this is all for liberation. Um, uh, uh, but at the same time, sure, she, again, she may not have asked for anything, but we, as a larger collective, should have provided, if that makes any sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so I do think that uh, activists are thinking in those ways and in those terms. I've also just recently learned of, a, of um, uh, 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 tons of sort of um, uh, social activity happening, economic activity happening in the Boston area, uh, particularly around what they're calling a solidarity economy which is essentially my project, <laughs> like my project in contemporary um, uh, uh, parlance. Um, but um, folks can, can take a look at uh, the Center for, uh, what is it? The Center for Popular Economics uh, and the Center for uh, Economic Democracy, um, two organizations that are doing some great work around um, rethinking economy and rethinking value, rethinking exchange um, in more collective terms as opposed to self-interest um, and privatist terms. And so um, uh, I would encourage folks to sort of go to those sites and see what activists are doing out there in um, the Boston area. So yeah, I think folks are thinking about it and I think movement's happening. And I think, you know, COVID and the pandemic is helping folks to realize that this just can't be, that organizing for the relief and the support of other people can't just be a sort of a natural disaster moment. It's been helpful that folks have termed uh, racism as 
the twin pandemic with COVID, mm-hmm. right? And so I'm hoping that that carries further, right? That yes, there is a crisis and has always been, right? Uh, and so let's focus on this crisis in a very democratic way. Um, so uh, one last question for me before yes. I open it up. Um, um, you said at the beginning that you've been here and you hardly know it. <laughs> and that's, of course, understandable. And yeah. I've really, uh, I mean, at least you had a few months on campus. I have really yeah. felt deeply for people who started this year and it's just been all of this. So I guess I'm wondering um, in this context, how uh, we get to know you better, this is certainly one way, but Mm -hmm. also how we can help you um, know and think about how your work might have a particular meaning and application in this context? <laughs> um, good question. Um, so one way, and, and again, I, I take my lessons from former activists. Um, and so uh, I have sent random emails to many faculty on campus just to say hello <laughs> and, to, and to make connections. Some have responded, some haven't, but that's okay. Um, but also I've gone to the students um, and I've you know just, scheduled meetings with them to talk with them um, to get a sense of how they're feeling on campus, how they, you know, what they think about their place on campus and uh, the nature of race and blackness at UMD, et cetera. Um, And I've been in conversation with them actually about uh, the possibility of um, of building out a, a student run and operated barbershop on campus. Um, a space that, you know, there, I think there are spaces on campus. Narumbu is a fantastic space. I think that black students deserve more than one space. Uh, so, um, but also a space that provides, that allows, you know, a cross section of folks across class levels, transfer students come in and they're like, ah, I'm here for a couple of years and I'm trying to find my way. And I think there's a way of, providing a refuge for students, but also a platform for them, not just as a meaning to get a haircut or get their natural hair done, but certainly as, as a platform to understand their world and, um, and the world that they want to make. Um, and uh, I think barbershops have helped to do that. Um, and so uh, I've, I've been talking with them about if that's something that, that uh, and they've suggested that, that that would be a really cool thing to do, uh, again, coming from them not as a top-down initiative, right? Uh, but coming from the ground up. And so I think those have been ways in which I've, you know, um, tapped um, uh, uh, UMD and tried to understand, um, understand the campus and so forth. So, um, so one, engaging with students and two, um, I may send an email to, to some folks just to wrap and say hello. Uh, so it would be nice if you would respond. <laughs> You would respond to say hello. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, no, I think that's that that's a great invitation to many who are watching you. And, and I would say I love the idea of a barbershop, but I'm also sitting here thinking about what about braids? What about <laughs> no, 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 no. And that's and I think that is that is certainly the idea that it would be a sort of a, a barber beauty salon deal, right? Yeah. Where sort of natural hair would be done and certainly engaging with community and community professionals. Um, um, uh, engaging with community college, uh, and so that's there's a there's a there's there's a thing there. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, I'm gonna open it up uh, at this point, and people have been putting some things in the chat, sure. and I'm sure there are other things. Um, so, Linda, I'll turn it over to you to pose the questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm going to. Um, I don't think we have time to get through all of these questions, but I'm gonna start at the top and um, maybe try to combine a couple of these because I noticed that they are related about organizations. One of them, for example, is have you found examples of donors or contributors trying to shape or influence the way organizations go about this work? In other words, were there efforts to temper radicalism? And relatedly, do organizations shape themselves in certain ways to attract funding? So uh, 
uh, I'll, I'll try to be asking a historian to be brief is difficult. So I'll, <laughs> but I will try to try to do that. Um, so uh, to that question, uh, the reference that I mentioned earlier about the voter education project is a, is a great example um, where these foundations um, essentially wanted to sort of shift um, SNCC and SNCC activists to, you know, away from direct, direct action, direct and radical action. Um, a little uh, that they knew was that voter registration was actually also direct action and it was also quite radical action, right? Um, so that is an example. Um, Megan Francis, uh, political scientist, I'm forgetting the, the title of her book. Um, uh, she has written a book on um, the NAACP and she argues that uh, the NAACP's um, uh, initial work around anti-lynching shifted to education when they received foundation money. Um, and so that's a great book to look at to answer that question. Um, uh, again, I can't, the, the title is, is escaping me, but Megan Francis is, um, she teaches political science at um, uh, University of Washington. Uh, so you can find that book. Um, so there you go. Thank you. What we have done with former colloquia is have Ashley reach out to you and maybe collect some of those lists of resources sure. and then share them with everyone who has registered for this presentation. Sure. Um, yes, okay. Should it be incumbent on Black organizations and philanthropists to provide the means for survival to the entire African American population, or should this be the responsibility of the US government and taxpayers at large? Totally the responsibility of the state. Totally the responsibility of the state. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In the absence of that, of the, <laughs> in the absence of that, of, of them doing that, something has to be done. Uh, and so, yes, this is about survival, frankly. It's totally the responsibility of the state, period. Um, I was hoping to organize a bail fund in Poughkeepsie when I was in New York. Um, and some of my colleagues uh, in the group uh, thought that a bail fund was just propping up the system, right? That if that was just about reform, that wasn't about abolition. And I said, that's absolutely true. However, today, somebody's about to be arrested and they're about to sit in jail. And I think that, that, that somebody should help them and their, and their families. And so therefore, let's do this and the other thing, right? Let's, let's, let's work on the bail fund and fight for abolition. So absolutely the state's responsibility and that's what we should certainly be fighting at the same time, right? We gotta do something right now. I think we also have time for two more. There's two more here that have not been addressed in your talk so far. When you look at the DMV, the local area, with so many Black identified immigrants alongside longstanding African American communities, what does Black capitalism look like? That's a great question. Um, I'll try to answer that in 30 seconds or less or so. Um, black capitalism is many things, I just have to say. Um, and in some cases, it's just capitalism, <laughs> right? With black folks at the helm. Um, uh, in some cases, it's not capitalism at all. It's just folks trying to, you know, trying to make some, trying to earn some money, right? Um, and so, but it sounds like the question is about uh, diaspora in some way. Um, and so I'm not right, quite I sure. Think, I think it's about is, do you feel that there are local contexts that, that around this concept here, maybe in other ways. Local context around black capitalism. Uh, sure, absolutely, right. So, you know, I think uh, uh, folks who immigrate to the US in some cases, right, are searching for a kind of um, free enterprise or free market, right, a kind of an American dream. Um, uh, uh, and so, you know, the market is tethered to freedom for some folks. Um, uh, uh, for others, it's not so much about the market, but it's just so much about all like, this is what I got. I don't have too many other opportunities. I can't get a job. Wherefore, if I can't do this work in the underground economy um, because of you know the threat of incarceration, what am I left to do? And so I think the realm of black capitalism, frankly, there, are, there isn't a whole lot of capital there. 
I would say that black capitalism by large uh, is akin to thinking about racism as an interpersonal deal, right? And so um, black folk by and large can't run a capitalist system because we don't control the mechanisms of, 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 a, of a capitalist market, right? And so sure, some one person uh, can be a business owner and can be all about the profit, uh, but capitalism is not about one person <laughs> by far. Neither is racism about one individual act of discrimination. It's about a larger systemic deal. And so by and large, I don't think black entrepreneurs uh, have this kind of power to sort of run and fuel a capitalist market, right? Individual people do, but capitalism is not about the individual. It's about, the, it's, it, it, it's about a larger social structure. Thank you. We only have three minutes left. So I think unfortunately we've run out of time for questions and I, I wanna leave the last two minutes to Bonnie to wrap us up. Thank you very much. And I think you're, yeah. Wrap us up. I was waiting for the next question. Um. We can take <laughs> one more question Let's if do people one don't more. mind. Let's do one more. I'll be quick, okay. I'll be quick. Do one more. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so the last question is, uh, has some background to it. And then the question, thinking of congregation and economic support, NAACP corporatist structure is providing support in a particular way, but also inviting funds from those who can provide substantial amounts for these purposes. Direct grants approach invites small donations, not only money, but clothes, shoes, et cetera. How do forms of fundraising encourage different kinds and different forms of congregation? Yeah, so uh, I think that's the narrative, that's, that's the narrative that has to change. Um, what, I, what, I, what I liked about the 1970s and the sort of model 60s and the model cities um, uh, um, on programs was that federal funds bypassed municipalities and went straight to community organizations, right? Um, and so what I do believe that needs to happen is that individuals need funds uh, and that funding and that, so essentially the narrative of fundraising should, should change from let's give a lot of money to organizations to look, people's lives can be transformed in this a capitalist um, system if you just give them the resources, right? Look, just give me some money and let me make some decisions here. And I think that's what's missing. People don't trust, funders don't trust individuals to make their own decisions. And that's the problem. And that's what we need to sort of, that's the narrative that we have to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Quincy. Thank all of you for uh, coming out today. I think you've also, you demonstrated so clearly how kind of a knowledge and understanding of a historical trajectory really illuminates um, a way of thinking about what we're seeing and engaging in and how we're acting today. Um, this is really wonderfully complex work. I'm loving hearing about it. I thank you and thank you all for joining us and join us uh, for the next colloquium. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you so much.